Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Amy Haddon with Schneider Electric's Energy and Sustainability Services. Today is February the 24th, and I'm joined by three of my colleagues in our energy management practice, Jeremy Warner, Aaron Decker, and Greg Maraska. We're going to talk today about the situation that occurred last week in the Texas ERCOT energy market. We know that many of you have questions about what happened and the implications that it has in the future. And so we're joining together today to bring you that information. Um, we'll certainly be available to respond to any questions as follow up if you post those into our social media channels afterwards. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and kick off starting with Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, you are really our team's leading expert on the Texas, the Texas market and, and the energy management dynamics that are there. Um, could you give us a, a recap of what happened last week? Yeah, so last week, <clears throat> Texas experienced some of the coldest temperatures they have in 80 years. Um, you had uh, temperatures that got down into the single digits, uh, which is really unusual for Texas. They're just not prepared uh, usually for these type of events. You had ice and snow. And so um, uh, ERCOT, who manages the grid conditions in Texas, they run the spot market, uh, they make sure there's enough supply and demand. They were watching this as well, sending out warnings. And then when the cold front came through, um, unexpectedly, uh, natural gas generators, some coal generators, a nuke generator, uh, some of the fossil fuel generators that are usually available in ERCOT, as much as 34,000 megawatts tripped offline. Um, Actually, at one time, I think it was 45,000 megawatts, which is more than half the uh, ERCOT grid uh, went offline. And, uh, you know, the grid's just not prepared for that type of shock. Mm -hmm. And um, ERCOT, for its part, mm -hmm. um, instituted controlled blackouts mm -hmm. to try to maintain stability so that all of Texas didn't lose their power. And this was a very impactful event. It led to as many as 4 million people being without power at one time. Uh, and it then turned into a humanitarian event where uh, people couldn't heat their homes for multiple days. Um, uh, pipes burst, people couldn't get drinking water. Uh, and still to this day, there's a drinking water problem and a shortage in Texas. So uh, what evolved into, you know, or what initially was just a cold weather event and a power event ended up being a humanitarian crisis. And, um, and now, um, even after the humanitarian crisis, now comes the financial impact uh, because the spot market price, and if customers were exposed to that spot market, uh, the price went from about $30 a megawatt hour on average to, uh, for multiple days, $9,000 a megawatt hour. So a customer that may have paid $30,000 on a commercial bill may end up with a million dollar bill for February. Uh, so we're going to be looking for that, but uh, obviously this has multiple implications across, you know, um, the power infrastructure to uh, the humanitarian level, um, regulatory level, and then uh, on the financial implication level for customers. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And I know that the dynamics are, are still changing. Um, so this is just our most recent update and we'll continue to provide updates as the situation continues to resolve. I know that one of the things that we've discussed as a team is that um, these types of shock weather events, extreme weather events are becoming more frequent. And Aaron, I'll introduce you now. Uh, Aaron Decker is the director of our client management team for our renewables procurement division. Aaron, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the implications of a changing climate and, and how that really uh, affects our customers that are looking to procure energy. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, you know, I think we all sort of are starting to realize that you hear this once in a lifetime or once in a hundred year of weather events and they're happening year after year. And so obviously that has implications um, for all of us as individuals as we just heard, but also for clients. And, you know, I think it really highlights the, the continued need to accelerate towards clean energy as one of the, the solutions to um, reduce climate change. I think it's one of a many sort of a package of solutions that there are clients, you know, should be thinking about, but that's really the best way to um, avoid some of the risks um, that might take place is to really try, try to reduce that. So, and that's definitely something that we think about with our clients. And, um, you know, many clients are already 
working in that regard, but would really encourage them to keep doing that. And so it's funny, that's a long game, right? That is a very, like, it's hard to say, well, we had this big event that had all these implications, but really the long game is this weather events are caused in part by climate change. And so we all need to be doing what we can to try to prevent that because it will prevent these sort of, hopefully, um, these sort of things from taking place that have so many implications as Jeremy just talked about. Yeah, thank you, Erin. And, you know, Jeremy had referenced that a lot of the, the freeze off that occurred in ERCOT was in traditional fossil generation. But I know that early in the week, there had been some speculation about wind turbines uh, underperforming. And yeah. um, would you say anything to organizations that might be looking at renewables procurement and, and what they might want to think about going forward? Yeah, it's definitely true that the wind, wind is the primary renewable um, asset technology in, in the ERCOT Texas region right now. And I haven't heard final numbers, but there's some estimates that a half to two thirds of the wind turbines that were either offline or underperforming at some point during this, you know, week long um, event, you know, obviously not just a wind turbine issue, it was, as you said, a all generating uh, technologies issue. And we've gotten the question a lot, which is, well, you know, wind turbines are in Sweden, they're in Antarctica, and they run. Like, why did this happen in, in Texas? And um, that's also not just a wind turbine issue because uh, it actually adds, you can winterize and weatherize all sorts of power equipment, not just wind turbines. But, you know, for, for wind projects, it adds about 5% to the cost. And so Texas, because this is unusual, um, doesn't require or regulate that not only, you know, wind, but any other assets really be winterized to the degree that you might expect as standard practice in Sweden. And that, you know, implications on price are important. And so, um, you know, I don't view it as surprising necessarily that these projects weren't weatherized and winterized, but um, there hasn't necessarily been such a practical need to do that. Um, however, you know, back to the potential for climate change events happening over and over, I think there's a conversation that needs to be had. I can't conclusively say what the right decision is for clients, but certainly a conversation and an understanding of what that might look like. And I think it's the same with any transaction you're doing. You need to really understand the risks and the market that you're entering into. And so I don't think that's changed with this, it just adds another layer of complexity around, you know, what could happen to a transaction or a project during an extreme weather event um, like the one that just took place. Yeah, thank you, Erin. And of course, you know, we're we're seeing climate risk really enter the mainstream conversation. Um, certainly investor action is is really heightened on this topic. If uh, if you haven't already read Larry Fink's 2021 letter, that's effectively what the letter speaks to is climate risk. And so we know that customers are going to be facing more of these challenges going forward. So one of the solutions that we've identified is smart technology and distributed resources as well. And I'm going to ask Greg to join the conversation now. Greg's with our smart grid team here at Schneider Electric. Um, Greg, what what would you say is the potential role here um, for distributed technologies and the lessons that we could take away what to, from what happened in Texas in terms of how organizations, even communities, can potentially protect themselves against situations like this in the future? Yeah, thanks, Amy. It, it's a really great point. We heard great overview from uh, Jeremy and Aaron in terms of you know what's happening on the supply side, but what can municipalities commercial and industrial facilities, what can they do to address these things? And, and one option is to take advantage of localized distributed energy resources through something called a microgrid. And if I could, just to kind of dive into it, really talk about the three threes of, of microgrids. Um, and so the first is really, what is the goal? And there are three pieces to that goal. And the first is, you know, energy that is smartly procured. Both Jeremy and Aaron, you know, mentioned cost, mentioned price. I mean, the bottom line is still going to be significant, even during these different difficult times, is understanding what the cost is. And when you can procure that energy um, in an efficient and smart way, it's going to make sense. But you need choices to be able to do that. Second within that goal is locally generated. And again, for efficiency sake, obviously the closer generation is to you. So if it's at your own facility, it's even more efficient, but also now that you can be a pro uh, consumer, in other words, produce and consume, you have some flexibility. And, and then the third there is efficiently consumed. You know, again, on the demand side, uh, energy efficiency may not be sexy, may not be as exciting as distributed energy resources, but it still has to be addressed and maintained because the, the watts that you don't use are the most efficient 
that's available. So that's the first in terms of addressing the goal, making sure that you have energy that is you know, smartly procured, that is locally generated as well as efficiently consumed. So understanding if that's the goal, then a microgrid could address that. Next is what the assets are. And again, as was mentioned, you know, talking about from a renewable side, perhaps solar uh, and or wind, uh, perhaps natural uh, landfill gas, you know, that's an option. Uh, the second being natural gas generation, CHP, very efficient as well. And the third being utility source. And then tying in second is energy storage, which obviously has gotten more cost effective, more popular, battery energy storage, very popular these days, that's key. And then third, getting back to the loads is efficient loads and being able to uh, configure those in a way in terms of what's critical, what's essential, what's non-essential. And then last is, is really the operating modes. And this is where you have, again, the flexibility when you have a microgrid of grid connected, the day-to-day, -day, you know, as uh, they're operating now in Texas, as they were operating before this terrible occurrence uh, in terms of last week, um, taking advantage of that utility. Uh, next, off-grid, when a situation like that arises and you need more resiliency being able to op operate off-grid. And then third is being able to transition in terms of the control of going from on-grid to off-grid. So that's a, a quick overview in terms of the three threes, but the bottom line is that on the demand side, having control, having capability, and being more efficient and sustainable, to Aaron's point, when you manage that. And particularly, Greg, I would I would assume in critical facilities, and I know we've done some work with um, municipalities, the Department of Defense, where they've got to have power 24-7. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but. Yeah, and, uh, two references that we can make, uh, you know, number one, in terms of a storm in 2012, a derechis in mid-Atlantic, that um, very similar to this critical situation is that even though it was a terrible storm, more people were affected, more people died afterwards because of power outage situations and actually during the storm. And Montgomery County decided that they needed more resiliency and actually address their public safety facility as well as their correction facility to make sure they had extended resiliency. And they were able to do that in an energy as a service model. They didn't have the money from a CapEx standpoint to outlay but we're able to address that mm -hmm. from energy service. And then the second point I'll make is uh, over at Miramar in San Diego, the uh, Marine Corps Air Station there, in that based on the outages they had last August for San Diego Gas and Electric, they were able to give back um, energy and keep 2,000 homes um, alive and up and running because San Diego Gas and Electric didn't need to supply it to the base. And uh, so, again, there are ways that can help in terms of being self-sufficient as well as helping the community. Mm, thanks, Greg. That's a really powerful example, especially in a case like Texas, where so many communities were so deeply impacted and where it, it really became even a justice issue for underserved communities in terms of getting the resources that they needed for their survival. Um, thank you all so much. I want to ask now a question um, generally to the group. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about the situation that occurred, a, a bit about how it affected some renewable generation specifically, and then some of the potential solutions that exist to remedy situations like this in the future. As a takeaway, I'd be interested to ask all three of you, what would be your best advice coming out of the week that we've just been through and understanding that the situation is evolving. But for any organization that's really looking to uh, protect itself against the kind of volatility that we saw last week, what would be your top recommendation? And Jeremy, I'll start with you. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think knowing your assets and knowing uh, your operations would be first. Um, if you know your assets and your operations, you can then come up with a plan, which is the second part, uh, come up with a plan to curtail or come up with an emergency plan in an event like this. And then thirdly, just keep in mind, um, you know, what your goals are as a, <clears throat> as a corporation or, or maybe come up with some goals uh, for being a good citizen and doing your share and your part to make sure that the, uh, this grid is sustainable. Uh, so that would be uh, my suggestion is, is really just to have a plan in place and, and be able to use your assets effectively. Jeremy, let me ask you a follow-up. Can you say a little bit of, 
about the role that data can play in really developing that that plan. Um, I understand that some of the challenges with the grid operation is that data was effectively slow to get where it needed to go. Yeah, so data is always a challenge. <clears throat> and as we become more digital, you know, it's going to be even more important. And uh, to be able to come up with the plan I was speaking of and to know your assets, you really have to have good data. So there are options out there uh, to have better data <clears throat> uh, through smart meter technology and, and other technologies. Great, thank you. Aaron, I'll, I'll pose the same question to you in terms of what preparedness organizations can take today. Yeah, I said it again. I said it earlier, but I'm going to say it again. The best way to lower risk around weather events related to climate change is to reduce carbon emissions. So that's the number one thing. And um, obviously, maybe a little more tactical for companies who want to do that through renewable energy transactions. You know, we um, spend a lot of time with our clients, not only, as I said earlier, making sure they really understand the market, but also making sure they are contracting and understanding around risks that we might say are very unlikely to happen, but not impossible. I mean, that's exactly what we had last week is something that I can think of some contract structures that when we talk about it, we're like, well, I don't know that this will ever happen, and maybe it has. So really being aware of what you're getting into and having that sort of proper knowledge and counsel as you're entering into transactions, you know, that protects the company who wants to do something about renewables, who, you know, and, and then in sort of service of a variety of goals, including reducing climate change. But doing that blindly um, is, is probably not a good idea either as it introduces other risks. So I'd say smart procurement, smart decisions towards um, climate change reduction strategies. Thank you, Aaron. And presumably, Jeremy, Aaron's advice would extend to energy management in general in terms of really evaluating your risks and clearly understanding what it is that you're contracting for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> all contracts are different and, uh, you know, customer goals and, and um, uh, risks are different. So, you know, customers need to know what uh, the implications of their contract structures are for sure, uh, you know, and um, uh, you can't always bank on historical uh, numbers uh, or historical settlements as uh, what's indicative of the future because things can change. And while we might say, um, you know, this is rare, um, you know, or give averages for the last 10 years of what, uh, you know, hourly prices have done, uh, what we have always caveated is that extreme weather events and um, sort of uh, black swan events can happen at any time with uh, little to no notice. And so you need to be aware of what the uh, risks are in your contract. Thank you, Jeremy. And certainly I think it makes an argument for the value of an energy manager and energy advisor like Schneider Electric. Um, Greg, let me put that question to you. And I, I appreciated what you shared earlier already on the call about microgrids. But is there anything that you would recommend organizations do immediately to explore their options for distributed resources? Yeah, Amy, you know, one point that, that I do have to um, point out is in terms of the pandemic, it has drastically changed the definition of critical facilities. And, and I think every uh, facility owner, operator, building, you know, has to understand where they fit in terms of change. I, I you know, I mentioned public safety uh, as well as correction facility, military bases. That was the and is the definition of critical. But now it's changed after the pandemic. I mean, grocery stores are critical, warehouses, logistic facilities, uh, gas stations, banks, you know, all this is critical. And, and for the most part, it's it's now what isn't critical. And in terms of, you know, the, the black swan events, the weather that both Aaron and Jeremy mentioned, you know, are your is your facility ready if people need to shelter in place? I mean, the last thing in a terrible storm, terrible situation you want to do is say, OK, we're closed go fend yourself and, and head home, uh, it could be even more dangerous. So do you have a facility that could operate in that sense? So I think people have to understand that um, their facility, there's a good chance that is a critical facility in some way, and therefore they owe it to themselves, to their employees, to their customers uh, to support it in terms of uh, if there is a situation from the grid and they need to supply their own power. That's great, Greg, and I think probably all of us could agree that if the last year has shown us anything, uh, disruption is the new norm. So really appreciate you putting the cap on that. I want to thank again my guests, Jeremy Warner, Aaron Decker, and Greg Moraska from the Schneider Electric Energy Management team. Thank you very much for joining us on this video. And as the situation in the Texas market continues to evolve, we'll share more information with you as it becomes available. Have a great day. Bye.